Okay. Hi, everybody. How are we doing? Great. Long afternoon. Uh, at least it is for me. Um, so, um, good afternoon. My name is Kevin McLaughlin. I'm the Dean of the Faculty and a Professor of English and Comparative Literature here at Brown. And I'm pleased to welcome you to the Presidential Colloquium Series, Thinking Out Loud, Deciphering Mysteries of Our World and Beyond. Uh, this is a presidential series, but unfortunately, President Paxson was not able to be with us here today, and she sends her regrets and also her welcome to all of you who are able to attend. I'm delighted to be here to offer a few prefatory remarks about the series uh, in her stead. This series was designed to attract some of the nation's leading thinkers to provide accessible public talks on topics in the sciences. During the last academic year, we were honored to welcome professors John Johnson, Emery Brown, Paula Hammond, Jim Gates, and Richard Tapia to Brown. Speakers have sought to explore such vexing questions as, are we alone? What is consciousness? What guards our reality against oblivion? And they've explored applying artful nanoengineering nano uh, to kill uh, cancer le less toxically, and the role of math in understanding the universe. The speakers in this series are experts, not only in their own fields, but in the art of making the big questions in their fields understandable to non-specialists. As a literary scholar, what has struck me about all of the speakers in this series is that I've had the strong sense in each case of a thematic, or even a narrative or dramatic dimension in the way they approach and describe their work. In the case of Corrine Gib Gibbs, for example, I read at the beginning of her research profile the following sentences. The goal of our research is to understand how cells and organisms distinguish between self and other. Specifically, we, in, in, this, in, in her lab, are investigating the molecular mechanisms underlying the ability of cells to discriminate self from non-self in the uropathogen Proteus Mirabilis, close quote. When I read this, as a scholar working on 19th century European literature and philosophy, <laughs> I hear a version of Hegel's description of self-estranged subjectivity in the preface to the Phenomenology of Spirit, and also the reflections of the poet Charles Baudelaire in his, write, in his writings about the threat posed to the poet, the lyric poet, uh, by, the, by the 19th century crowds of the Paris streets. So this is an interesting series in the sense that I think it puts us back in what you might call the universe of the university. It puts the universal back into the university. And, and it's, a, it's a great feeling when, when that happens, it seems to me. And for this, I'd like to thank Christopher Rose, professor of engineering and associate dean of the Faculty for Special Initiatives here at Brown. Chris received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. He's published extensively and has received numerous honors and awards. His current research is focused on interference avoidance, mobility management, non-standard communications models, biological communication. How's that for a theme? His field is communications theory, and he is committed to communicating science, communicating knowledge, and inspiring people to challenge themselves with big questions. And we're very happy to have him here with us uh, for the last uh, year or two um, as a professor of engineering <laughs> and as, as a colleague in the dean of the faculty's office. So I'd like to inv invite Chris to the podium to introduce our guest this evening, Karen Gibbs, associate professor of molecular and cell biology at Harvard, who will talk about social sociality in a bacterial world. Chris. Okay, wow, okay, so uh, we turned out. Um, a, a lot of you know me, a lot of you don't. That was a, th thank you, Kevin. You know, I, I didn't expect, so basically you're reducing my salary now. Right? <laughs> uh, but the, you know, the theme of this, the theme of this uh, colloquium is to look at the big questions. So, you know, the other thing is I want to do is I want to thank all of our sponsors, all of our, I, I was gonna make them stand up and, you know, wave, but I won't embarrass them. Uh, they all have chairs with their names on them. 
you know, and uh, as professors, we're making little jokes about that. Uh, but in any case, thank you so much uh, for, um, you know, for sponsoring this uh, talk and getting the word out to everybody. So, you know, what is this talk series about? How many folks have been to a previous Thinking Out Loud uh, talk before? Wow, so a whole bunch of newbies. This is great. Um, so what n normally comes next um, is, you know, to extol the virtues of the speaker and, you know, embarrass them and all like that. Well, every, everybody has a program? Okay, could you turn to page three? Okay. So, you know, if you look on page three, you'll see something, and basically the bio says this, Harvard, blah, 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 Stanford, blah, 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 postdoc, prestigious postdoc, blah, blah, Harvard, Associate, assistant associate professor, Packard Fellowship, um, you know, grant, blah, 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 blah. That's not why we invited Kareem here. <laughs> you know, this is a typical rising star uh, resume. You know, that's uh, given. But the reason we invited Kareem here is that she thinks differently. And those of you that have been here before, you know what I'm going to say next, and I'm going to pay her the highest technical compliment that I can pay anybody. She's just a little bit crazy. Okay? It's, and that's, that's, a, that's a precious sort of thing in our field. She looks at problems and she sees things that maybe other people don't see. And she tries to drill down uh, to the bottom of what's going on. And she does it with such a zest and a joy, as, as you'll see, that it's just, you know, pure joy to see for, uh, for all of us. But the specific thing that she's talking about, and Kevin kind of uh, mentioned it, is she's looking at sociality and bacteria. Now, the funny thing is, you know, we kind of reserve sociality for ourselves and maybe animals. You know, insects, nah, maybe ants, they're kind of social. We don't really think about, uh, or haven't for the longest, meaning, you know, talk about half century, uh, thinking about bacteria social. But if, you see, if you've seen pond scum, or if you've ever seen uh, Streptococcus uh, grow itself in a dish, something social's going on in there. But that's old news now. That's been known for, is it 20, 30 years? You know, that, that's really old news. The difference in what Kareen is doing, and this is where kind of the craziness comes in, Sociality is something that we're all familiar with. Well, how deep does that rabbit hole go? So Kareen is looking at molecular bases for sociality, for identity, for distinguishing self from other in bacteria. And the thing, she'll never admit to this, but really it makes somebody like me, a system scientist, uh, think, hmm, you know, are these suckers self-aware? Uh, I mean, are they aware of themselves as a group? So again, she'll never say that, but the work may end up leading there, and that would be fantastic, because that's one of the biggest questions there is, what is self? So with that, I'm not going to say any more and embarrass her anymore. Please welcome Kareen Gibbs. Hello, thank you Chris and Kevin and everyone for inviting me to give this talk today. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about our work um, and talk about it a little bit more globally than we sometimes do. And uh, as, you, as Chris mentioned, the title is Sociality and Identity in a Bacterial World. And I want to start with a small disclaimer. Um, we as humans are imperfect and our daily lives are constantly influenced by our environment, by our families, by our friends, who, who we are, our, our sense of being is not just who, how we were raised, but it's how we experience the world. And as humans, we also have consciousness. We can choose to do things differently. And as far as we know, bacteria don't have that. And quite frankly, when we bleach them and kill them in a the culture, I don't hear them screaming. So we're going to assume that they don't have that. And I want to really take a moment right now to say everything I talk about with bacteria, I personally do not see a direct connection to human consciousness, human identity, human sociality. I'm talking about a basic cellular behavior that we can use to understand the basis of the human immune system or the basis of territoriality. And so with that, I'm going to um, leap right in. And so this is going to be a movie. And on the right are cells that are um, colored white. And on the left, where you don't see anything else, there are other cells here. And we really want to know how do these cells, these foragers, feel as they enter into a population that's different? 
And my three-year-old would say, my, my current five-year-old, when she was three, she said it's kind of like um, seeing monsters in the middle of the night. You don't know what's around you, but you're no longer along around your friends. And so my lab really wants to drill into this and ask, how does an organism distinguish between kin, those that are genetically similar and those that are different? And so today, I will walk through um, several topics. First, I'll start talking by talking about self versus non-self recognition. I will then um, move into our model system, the bacteria in Proteus mirabilis. And then we'll answer two questions. How do Proteus populations dif display self versus non-self recognition? How do they define self-identity? And then some concluding thoughts. So from much work in the large animal field, so I call them the big biology field, we know that self versus non-self recognition is needed for territoriality. And a classic example is, are the wolf packs in Yellowstone. So for example, this is the Gibson wolf pack. Wolf pack. And it's made of uh, mainly siblings, where they work together to both defend their own territory away from other wolf packs, but they also have competition amongst each other about who is going to be the leader. We know that, territorial, that, that self versus non-self recognition is also needed for detection and defense against foreign cells within an animal. And the example here is um, organ rejection. And on the left is a healthy, normal human kidney. And on, on the right is a kidney that has been removed after <coughs> transplant rejection. And this is a really big problem in transplant temptation, is that even when the markers are as close as we can get them, you still have to suppress the immune system in order for that patient to keep that organ going. You might have heard earlier this week that the first uterine transplant, the uterus transplant in a human failed. And this is, this is the basis of that. We also know that self versus non-self recognition is needed for sharing resources among siblings. And in this case, I've taken an example of the invertebrate sea tuna kid, Botrylis, where our Weizmann's lab at Stanford has shown that two colonies of this Botrylis um, sea tuna kid, which you can find on, on rocks in the Bay Area, um, they actually will fuse their vesicles, that fuse their lines, and share stem cells between neighboring colonies as long as you're genetically identical. If you're different, those blood vessels get um, burnt off and you can see a scar separating colonies that are genetically different. That's crazy. I mean, this is a simple <coughs> organism. We also know that self versus non-self recognition is needed for population separation in bacteria. And I'll come back to this movie, but long story short is that bacteria can actually form a boundary visible to the human eye and stay separate. And what we know from all of these behaviors is that this is a social behavior. It's not just one organism. It's a group of individuals have to work together to give the input, um, um, to give the input of whether something is self or not. And so we can turn to what we know from animal biology and really the work of Ed Wilson and others and look at the field of sociobiology, which is the biology of social activity. And I've thrown in one equation for the engineers out there. But it's a very simple microbiology <laughs> version of the equation, which is that um, Ed Wilson proposed that social behavior can be described as a function of the genes. So that those are what's on your chromosome, what you've inherited from your parents. This is not going to change. Well, with CRISPR, maybe it'll change a little bit. But for most of us, you're born with these genes. This is your life. And population dynamics. How do individuals or cells within an individual interact with one another? These two work together to give you a social output. So if we take the example of the Gibson pack in Yellowstone, we, we are a little bit um, hamstrung because the genetics are complex. They have a lot of chromosomes. So chromosomes are where the DNA is. There's a lot of them. There are over 7,000 genes. For a geneticist, this, you know, no offense to eukaryotic geneticists out there, but as a microbiologist, whoa, that's way too much. And quite frankly, each unit, even though it's one organism, one organism has many cells. These cells can be brain cells, so neurons. They can be kidney cells. They're, you know, you have tissues on your cell surface, and they all like each other, and you have to deal with all that complexity. And so it, it leads to a really large predictive distance between how the genes are contributing to so, um, social behavior. You have to get across this huge distance to be able to under, start being under, under um, to pull out the roles of the genes. And so as a microbiologist, we like to simple things, um, simplify things if possible. 
And back in 2005, Pete Greenberg, who I did my postdoc with, proposed this idea of socio-microbiology as a biology of any group behaviors of microbes. And so this is um, a staph culture, uh, uh, no, sorry, a salmonella culture. It doesn't really matter. But you can see they're piled upon each other. They make this nice little home where they're in close contact with one another. And so if you take the same framework that I just showed you um, as a function of social biology, we can now ask this in bacteria. And with bacteria, things become really easy. For most bacteria, including the one I study, there's one chromosome. That's it. And there are only 4,000 genes. And in fact, we can knock out, we can turn off about 3,600 of those 4,000 genes at any point that we want. Each unit is still one organism, but guess what? Each organism is just one cell. You no longer have to worry about the complexity of multicellularity. Every cellular cell is an organism, and every single um, organism is one cell. And so this allows for the predictive distance between what the genes are and what the outcome of that social behavior to be to be much smaller. And so we use this framework to really ask, what, how are genes contributing to self versus non-self recognition? Why do we even bother to do this? And this is my selling point for all the young people in the audience who haven't chosen your careers yet. Become microbiologists. It's really fun. And in fact, don't just become any microbiologist. Become a social microbiologist. Because we can learn a lot from studying these organisms in this light. One, we know we can, you can use this to look at sh broadly um, shared principles, underlying principles that have been conserved over time for how populations can um, distinguish self from other. We also can use this to understand potentially pathogenic bacteria better. And in doing so, we can also come up with new techniques for treating them, but also for harnessing them for other applications. They're not necessarily our enemies. We can also use them as tools. And that's some of what my lab works towards. And so together, we can really use this framework of self versus non-self recognition um, in bacteria to dissect genetic and environmental influences on a fundamental group behavior. Before we can do that, of course, you have to have some definitions. When you're a human, when you think of self, I, I very confidently consider myself one person. I don't share my body with anybody else as far as I know. Um, with bacteria, how does a, ba a single celled organism really think of self? And so we define it in this organism as nearly genetically identical organisms that align themselves for shared benefit. In other words, they're clones, they're siblings. We think that this is a way for them to handle diversity both within their species, but outside of the species. If you're a bacterium, so uh, can everyone raise their hand and kind of wiggle it around like this? Guess what? You just knocked off about 1,000 bacteria. <laughs> Sucks to be dumb, <laughs> right? And so if you're a bacterium, you're constantly facing other things. You're constantly um, trying to find your way in the world. And so you need a way to, to navigate that. And so as I said before, we study this in the simplified model system Proteus. Now, I have a colleague who says that her bacterium, she loves it more than her children. I can't quite say that. I, I, I love my children a lot, but Proteus is pretty awesome. So this is, I'm going to spend the next couple minutes talking about Proteus itself. Um, Proteus Mirabilis is named after the Greek god Proteus for the ability to change shape. In liquid, it's a short little rod, and there's some images right here. It's about one to two microns long, so it's really short. It has one chromosome per cell. It's very much like E. coli and any other garden variety bacterium. But on the surface, it'll oscillate between being a short cell between one to two microns to growing to being a cell that's anywhere from 10 to 80 microns long. So that's a 40-fold increase in growth in a single cell cycle. So let's imagine one of us becoming a giant bigger than this building just by, you know, and this is in 20 minutes. That's incredible. This morphological change also leads to the duplication of their chromosomes. So rather than having one chromosome, they can have up to 40 chromosomes per cell. And so, you know, quite frankly, you know, when you think about in, that bacter in bacteria, that's a lot of complexity in one cell. It's found in multiple environments, including the human gut. In about 40% of you, Proteus is happily sitting there as part of your normal gut microbiome. That's the only time I'll say microbiome this entire talk. Um, it's about 40% of you, it's there. Some other cool places that's been found is in oysters. So I hope, I don't know if anyone enjoys the oysters this time of year off the coast. You're bathing yourself in Proteus, um, giving yourself a nice inoculation. It's also been found in snake venom, and it's been found in the salivary glands of blowflies. It's also an opportunistic pathogen. For those of you who are unfortunate, oh, excuse me, um, unfortunate enough to have a long-term catheter, we'll talk about in a few minutes about the disease that it causes. 
Now, its ability to grow into this huge 80 micron cells allows it to have a very unique behavior on the surface, which is that it can walk fast. And it can walk uh, really fast in groups. And so I'm going to show you a number of movies throughout this whole talk. And they all are, um, are sped up to about the same speed, about 10 times real speed. Uh, the scale bar is on here on the bottom left of the screen. Uh, the light gray surface is the nutrient surface in which they're moving. And these dark rods that you see that are moving quickly are the cells. If you look closely, the cells are moving fairly rapidly when they're in large groups. And they move much slower when they're in small groups or by themselves. We know that this motility, which we call swarming, <coughs> is, requires cell-to-cell -cell contact, and it requires that they be um, oxygen-bathed on the surface. <coughs> the other thing I'd like to point out is that unlike many cells, they actually can move bidirectionally very fast. So it's more like the Audubon in Germany on a really good day. They can just <laughs> zip right past each other as opposed to gridlock, say, on the LA freeways. Um, the last thing is that cells can be carried by their neighbors. And so this intimate contact uh, changes that they, they, they you basically can hand over your interactions from one cell to another. You're not tied with any one local environment. This very microscale behavior leads to a macroscale human visible output, which is the occupation of a 10 centimeter diameter dish in under 24 hours. Okay, so remember these cells start off as 80 microns. They can occupy that whole space in that short period of time. In this movie that I'll show in a minute, we've inoculated cells in the center, and we allow, and, the, and we've taken, we took images over several time points and, and compiled it. One thing you'll note right away, though, is that Proteus has this characteristic bullseye formation to the swarm migration. And this, um, and this is due to the oscillation between short cells and long cells. Cells divide and are short, and then they elongate and are able to migrate outwards. When they um, divide again, they stop and make a rigid um, periphery. And then once they're able to elongate, once again, they migrate. And so you'll see this repeated in this movie, which I'll let you just watch. And so inoculation, and you can see this rapid period of migration, and then consolidation, migration, consolidation. This uh, rapid motion, one should remember that all cells within this population are self. We started off with under 100 cells, so every single cell is a sibling except for slight mutations, but they all are genetically identical for all cases and purchases. And the swarming is actually essential for their colonization during infection. They need to do this in order to get to the site of infection. So um, my colleague warned me to, that I should have mentioned that we have some, a couple of gross slides. This is the one really gross slide. This is a catheter be, um, before it's inserted, and this is a catheter that's been removed from a patient with a Proteus, bio, um, Proteus infection. Proteus is the number one cause of catheter-associated ur urinary tract infections. What happens is Proteus actually uses that swarming motility and crawls from your gut up the outside of your catheter rapidly and then invades your bladder, where it then kicks off any bacteria that's living on that catheter and colonizes and sits there. It also has, secretes a virulence protein, an enzyme, that changes your bladder pH from being 7 to pH 9, which then allows all that nice phosphate to crystallize out. So worse than it just being you know, this yucky bacterial stuff on your bladder, you also then have phosphate crystals crudded in there. So you can imagine these catheters get blocked. If you have a catheter, you probably need it. And so how we treat um, and when we actually look, we find that these blockages can start happening as few as five days before, um, after insertion. And so this is the catheter eye hole. I know it's hard to see, but you can see how it's quickly closing. And here are the nice little Proteus cells happily making their colony and life there. Um, how you treat a Proteus infection is that you have to remove the catheter, treat with antibiotics, and reinsert the catheter. There are reports of Proteus infections lasting for over a year after catheter removal. Um, we also know that over 50% of long-term catheters eventually will get blocked. Now, this is my, my one disclaimer. If you're ever in a nursing home, if you're ever in a hospital, you should have your catheter removed daily. That's the easiest treatment. The reality is that given our current healthcare system, that's not possible. And so catheters are staying in for longer and longer periods. But we know that by three to four days, Proteus will be the dominant um, uh, um, organism there. And so even removing by day five or day six is too late to prevent these infections. Um, we also know that these bladder stones that I was telling you about, these, these phosphate crystals, they're a great hideout for bacteria. 
And so but the, the crystals actually form around the bacteria. So even though you take out the catheter, these little microstones are staying there. And they're really resistant to antibiotics. And so part of the persistence of that infection is that you actually have proteins that's not getting treated by the antibiotics. Um, as I just said, the, the biofilms also protect against antibiotics. And these are persistent and recurrent. Now, one of the things that's really interesting is that um, a series of work from Sabuba and, and colleagues has shown that an identical proteus strain is isolated from both the, from the urine, the bladder, and the catheter. In other words, when you get a proteus infection, you're infected by your own clonal population, right? So my infection is not going to be the same as Chris's infection, which is not the same as Kevin's. It's your own body that's infecting you. We don't see any super strain of proteus. There's no one master strain that's the most virulent of all that's going to kill all the other proteus strains. It seems really democratic. As far as we can tell, they each have a chance of, of causing infection. We also know that in the lab, we can see proteus segregate between populations. And so here, um, on, on, the, on the north and on the west, are swarming populations uh, from this blue isolate, which was taken from one patient. And you can see, and where you see the dark yellow is where we inoculated the cells originally. And you can see when the two populations from this one patient meet, they merge and make one large population. And the same thing from this other um, isolate from a patient, this orange strain, where they meet to get this one large population. But yet, you see this huge, almost Grand Canyon version of a gap between the orange strain and the blue strain. And this has been known for 100 years. Why in the world would these populations care about separating from one another? And, we can, and, and so we can use the fact that we know that proteus can exhibit self versus non-self recognition in multiple environments to then ask in the lab, can we start to get to the underlying factors that are driving either the merging, so the interclation of the strains. In this case, we've labeled one strain in red and one strain in green. And you can see that they happily intermingle with one another. Or you know what I'd call the battlefield where in this case we've labeled one screen red, uh, red and the other one in green, and now you have this very sad place. Um, and so we use this, and we, what we've known, so what we've been able to tell so far is that cell first non cell recognition requires direct cell contact. If you don't let the cells contact each other, you don't ever get a boundary. You can put a filter between them, and the populations will go right up to each other and never form a boundary. We also know that this cell contact, that this self recognition requires swarming. We only ever see it while the cells are moving on the surface in an environment where we know they're required to be social to make progress. And so from all of this, we know that self versus non self recognition in Proteus, it's an intimate and local behavior between neighboring cells. This isn't your garden variety squirm sensing where you're shouting from one side of the room to another side of the room. This is the handshake, the coming up to your neighbor and saying, hi, who are you? Having to actually know who you're talking to. And so, one of the first questions we asked was how genetically different do two neighboring populations need to be, in this case, the orange and the blue. And when we look at just a segment of the genome, you can see that in general, so every time you see um, uh, green uh, colors where it goes to the top, that means there's almost 100% um, identity between these genomes. You can see there's some places where there's white, which means they're different, but they're pretty similar. And in fact, between the orange and the blue strains, the genomes themselves are over 93% similar. But we know that 7% of the genome is different. So remember that number of 4,000 genes I told you about? 7%. That's still about 300 so genes. That's a lot of work. I think that what that would be maybe four graduate students knocking things out. Um, I don't know how many of you are graduate students, but if you have to make knockouts and you don't know if there's a thing that's happening, it's a lot of work. And so as a, a geneticist, we want to simplify the question. There are many genetic differences between strains. How many of these dif differences contribute to self versus non-self recognition? And how can we actually simplify this? So instead of asking between two different strains, we said within one given strain, can you force its daughter cells to think that there's something different? Right? So it's a different question. How, what does it take to cause difference to happen as opposed to cause similarity to happen? And so what we do is we take the power of genetics and modern technology and lots of hard work from many people, and we can make what we call a library of mutants in which each mutant has a different gene um, dis um, disrupted. So all of the cells start off the same. We, in this case, used a, an element that basically knocked out one gene at a time, and we made a whole bunch of daughter cells where they had different changes everywhere in the genome. And we then array them out so that every population only has that one mutation. Right? So now you have, it's, imagine if you go to the library 
right? So in your library, you have 10,000 books. That's essentially what we did. We made a 10,000 book library all from the same backbone, but each gene has been changed a little bit. And we asked, of these genes, how many of them cluster with their parent and think everything's fine? And how many of them get isolated and segregated off? And I'm going to tell you about um, one cluster of them. But uh, from my lab with, my, with our organism, we know that there are three main clusters that contribute to this. And today, we're really going to talk about this orange cluster. And the fun thing about this orange cluster is that when you take away all of those orange genes, this is where we saw this boundary forming. So I want to remind you again that if the orange genes were present, these two populations would fully merge. But when the orange genes are gone, over time, you see a boundary visible to the human eye emerge. So this is not an immediate effect. This is an effect that takes time and, and interaction. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about these orange genes. The only two of them that I really want you to remember for the rest of the talk are D and E. And, and um, I appreciate, Chris, you saying it's for a broad audience, but I can't help but geek out a little bit. So for the bio, and I, and I, and I apologize for the non-biochemists out there. But they're really fun proteins. So the D protein is 1,000 amino acids long. So this is a massive protein when it, and when it comes to um, bacterial proteins. It has two predicted transmembrane domains. And what's really notable is that if you look across um, multiple variants of this D protein, they are about a, um, over 96% conserved in amino acid residues, except for this flanking region around the transmembrane 2, where the conservation goes down to as little as 70%. D's partner protein is this protein E. And it's a much smaller protein. It's a very traditional um, uh, signal receptor type protein. It has two transmembrane domains. But again, like D, it has this pattern where the vast majority of the protein between different variants are over 96% conserved. But that transmembrane helix, that little region here, has as little as 30% conservation in amino acid sequence between isolates. Um, in proteus strains, we can only ever find one copy of D. And this will, come, this will be important. We can only ever find one copy of D. We often find over one copy of E. We found as many as eight copies of E in the genome, but only ever one D. Now, as I said before, if I'm just um, zeroing in a little bit, I wanted to highlight that all the differences in D do not occur just in this transmembrane loop. So I've now reoriented this. This is a prediction of the protein. I've um, shown you the little diagram from before. Here's the transmembrane helix 1, transmembrane helix 2. Um, it's thought to be exposed to periplasm. Everywhere you see yellow are differences between different variants, but you can see most of those differences cluster right here in what we call the variable region. Similarly for um, E, you can see that there are differences elsewhere on the protein, but again, transmembrane helix 1, which is this dark orange, transmembrane helix 2, which is this light orange, almost all of these variabilities that we're talking about cluster in this one little region right here, um, which again we've highlighted in the light color. We call them the variable regions. We've done lots of work in the lab to show that these proteins do in fact localize to the cell envelope as predicted by their transmembrane domains. And this makes a lot of sense that if you're going to try and expose yourself to an environment, your cell, cell markers should be exposed to the environment in some way. For the remainder of the talk, for the simplicity of talk, I'm no longer going to use these you know, uh, more traditional icons. I'm going to switch to much simpler ones, a double rectangle or a rectangle with a circle. And the variable regions here will be highlighted again in the lighter color um, rectangles that you see. Okay. So we know, we knew genetically that the determinants of self-identity were in the cell envelope and that they were encoded by the gene, that they were encoded by the genes for D and E. And so two, I'm sorry, my pointer is having a hard time. So two folks in the lab, Leah Cardarelli, a former postdoc, and Chris Sinazak, really wanted to ask the question of do D and E form a complex that is the basis for identity information? And this is a little bit of a hard question because you have to ask not only is this a complex in one cell, but it's a complex between cells. Do the proteins even at, interact with one another? And so again, I'm going to geek out for one minute and show that we decided to take a biochemical approach to answer this. So we wanted to first know, do these proteins even interact with each other? And I said there are 4,000 genes. That means there are 4,000 proteins. So there are 3,998 3, other proteins they could interact with. And we're asking, can these two interact? And to do this, we do a pull-down assay. And how a pull-down assay works is that it's a fishing exposition. Has, how many of you fish? No one fishes anymore. OK. Um, hmm. How many of you bob for apples as a kid? OK, no one. OK, this is OK. 
I, I'm going to explain what a fishing expedition is. Essentially what we do is that we take E and we bind it to a hook. And then we take this hook with the E and we stick it inside a cell. And in this case, we actually lyse the cells and make a huge amount of extract. And we, all of that mixed together is what we call the load. And so that's the L here. And here I'm showing you Western blots where we've detected either for the presence of E or for the presence of D. And so when you see a little band here, it means E was there. When you see a little bit band there, you see that D was there. And there are all these other proteins. And so then we take this hook with E and we mix it around in the cell pond and we say, who's going to be there? And we pull out anything that will interact with E or anything else that is carrying along. So you can see this little rectangle is not actually interacting with E, it's interacting with something else. And then, quite frankly, you have lots of these hooks because you, know, you have lots in, in biology. And then we wash really vigorously. Because you want to get any hanger-ons, things that don't actually specifically bind to your protein, anything that's non-specific. And so we call that our wash, or the non-binding, non-specific interactions. And so that's a minus lane here. And you can see there's a, um, uh, as you can see, you can wash D and E off of your hook. But then, once all of that all junk is gone, you're still left with your specific interaction. And we can elute that off and take it off um, uh, using competitive elution, in this case, with the epitope that we're using. And we call that our positive lane. And basically what you're looking for is that when you uh, pull off your protein, who else comes down with it? And so if you see a band in the, in the rectangle, you see that E binds with D. And what we found was that when we look, um, used the orange E as the, as the thing on the hook, so it pulled down the orange D. And so in our stream, the D and E interact with one another. And this interaction is, is tight, and it doesn't need anything else. It doesn't need any of the other proteins from Proteus or E. coli to do this. We also know this is true for other strains we looked at. So I've just shown you one example here, that um, if you take the D and E variants from a blue strain, they also tightly bind one another. Now the question is whether or not they bind the orange strains E can actually bind the um, blue strains D. And so if you look at this blot down here, again, just focus in on this red box here. I hope you can all see there's no band. And so in other words, E, the orange E, though it can bind Ds, it can't bind the blue D. And in fact, when we pull the blue E, we can't get an orange D down. And when we look at many different strains, we cannot find D and E variants from different strains that bind one another. So the specificity of identity is actually simply encoded in the interactions between two proteins. Right? So, so, so I, I, I think, and so I'm going to rephrase that. It's not about who the whole cell is. In fact, for this bacterium, it's almost down to what does one of your proteins look like? And does your neighboring cell have its partner protein? And it's a little, um, uh, uh, it's a little facile to put it as that because it's not even the whole proteins. We wanted to know whether or not we could change the interactions and fool either the D or E protein to think that it's from a different strain. And so this requires us to go back and look at these maps again. So with the D protein between the orange and the blue D, I'm showing you all of the residues that are different. And you can really see that they, they, they cluster in the variable region. You can see they really cluster right here. And the same thing with the E, we can actually map the variable region to a very small region of the protein. So knowing this, we then made these um, Frankenstein proteins, where we asked, if we take an orange D and we take out its variable region and replace that variable region with the blue one, right? So th now the proteins are pretty much the same, except for just those regions of variability. Can they still bind their partner protein? And surprisingly, what we found was this Frankenstein D could no longer bind its E partner. Just switching what's less than 80 amino acids was enough to disrupt all interactions. But instead, it now interacts very specifically with the blue E. So not only did it disrupt its identity, but now it's gained a new binding specificity. Similarly, we looked at a Frankenstein E where we've taken the variable region of E and we asked, did it bind the um, orange D? And again, we saw a disruption of binding. And non-surprisingly, one now sees that, in fact, it's able to gain a binding interaction with the blue D. This led us to then ask whether or not this was sufficient for binding. And sure enough, if you replace both the variable region in the D and the variable region in the E, that's enough 
to cause two Franklin egg proteins to interact with one another. Now, that's a lot of protein information in a short talk. And so we're going to do, I, I teach microbiology, um, intro microbiology at Harvard. And now it's time for a quiz. OK. Um, so I've told you a lot about these proteins. And they've been kind of flying off in space. And they're kind of on cells and they're on cells. And really, the question isn't just binding interactions in, in, in vitro, but in vivo. If you now change an organism's DNA that's making and make it into a Frankenstein, Right? So now that organism for its cell surface markers has this Frankenstein DNA. Will it see its parent, the DNA that's orange, as self? Or will it now see this um, blue DNA as self or neither? And so to do this, I have to give you one um, uh, quick uh, background slide. So in this, this, this is our in vivo assay for self-recognition. And uh, on the left, and so every, there are four swarms here, um, one, two, three, four. Every population is genetically identical, except for the DNA variants that are shown above them. On the, le on the left, when the DNA variants are both orange, you can see that they make this beautiful merge into a single large colony. When the, blue, uh, when the uh, orange DNA strain uh, meets a blue DNA strain, you can see this very nice, clear boundary. So clearly, they see each other as different identities, and they see each other as the same. And so, excuse me, um, now comes the question. If you now have a Frankenstein DNA where um, they have the orange, uh, sorry, they have the blue DNA, have uh, blue variable regions from DNA have been replaced into this um, orange DNA, do they see this orange pair as self or as different? And do they see the um, blue pair as self or different or something in between? And so I know it's hard to do quizzes in large audiences. So I ask you to indulge me and everyone close your eyes a little bit and we're going to raise hands. <laughs> There's no end. But, uh, <laughs> so first question, what's visible? So these things are found in the membrane or here? I'm not answering that question yet. <laughs> so, 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 so this is, I mean, this is, this, and the reason I'm not answering the question is simply this, is that if it's about identity, it would, at this point, we're talking about things that proteins, right? And we're talking, we haven't yet talked about that physical interaction. And we've actually very carefully stayed away from the physical act interaction. So the question is whether your identity is something that's um, decided just within yourself. So is it protein-protein interaction or binding that's just within your own cell? Or is it a protein-protein interaction that's happening between cells? And I think that you, your opinion about that will affect your answer for this, OK? So, so humor me, and, and I'll give everyone maybe 10 seconds to think about it. But the, the long question will be, the short question will be, will there be a boundary here? Will there be a boundary here? Will there be a boundary in both? Or a boundary in neither? OK? So everyone close your eyes. Again, there's no, there's no harm in being right or wrong. Raise your hand if you think that there's a boundary in both. OK. Raise your hand if you think there's a, um, no boundary in both. OK. How many of you think that this new Frankenstein thinks of itself as orange? How many of you think the Frankenstein sees itself as blue? OK. Does anyone want to explain what they thought and why? Hey, pick on you, Kim. No, <laughs> no I guess that it would think of itself as blue because it has the blue variable, and that's what converting identity is. And that's exactly right. See, I, I picked the biologist. <laughs> um, that's exactly what we saw. And we were actually surprised that this would work. Um, and and the sh I'll give you the results first. And so as Kim um, uh, predicted, the blue the Frankenstein strain sees itself as blue. It's actually just changing these two short variable regions was enough to convert the identity of the strain from one to another. That's kind of scary if you think about it. So this is less than 80 amino acids. So that's you know somewhere around. Um, uh, you know, let's, say, let's call it about 300 nucleotides in a 4 million base per genome. That's enough to change things. So for a human, that would be really few genes. That's not very good. Um, uh, so that simply doing that was enough to convert it into blue and to disrupt it being orange. This was our premium experiment. 
What happened, though, was that when he first made these strains, we got a boundary in both. Okay? And that was because we cut the variable region too short in the D. And so if we didn't, so essentially, you have to be exactly right. You can't be sort of right. You have to be exactly right to convert to something else. It's easy to disrupt identity. But to actually convert to another identity, we had to have the exact perfect binding interaction. And that's why we found a surprising result to occur. Well, the other thing I just want to mention, it's not, it's not because I'm so smart, but rather I picked the coolest result. <laughs> <laughs> so excited. Yeah. 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 And of course, I'm presenting it because it's the coolest result. Um, and so you know, we often get the question of whether or not we've done the conversion in other strains. And we're working on that. Now, um, I just want to sum up the, the, this part of the talk and tell you that so far I showed you that DNA bind in vitro, the binding is strain specific, the variable regions de determine DNA binding, and the in vivo self identity correlates with in vivo um, in vitro binding. But one of the key parts about this is that the identity information, the, informa the actual you know, material to say who you are, is about the residues. It's about the amino acids that are in those proteins working together and interacting in a way that's productive. And so, of course, the question is, what are they controlling downstream? How are they changing cell behavior? Are they on the cell surface and interacting with the neighboring cell? Um, and so, I've told you so far about how the orange proteins encode and display self-identifiers. I'm happy to tell you some about the more recent work in the lab, talking about what the downstream genes are. Um, but I wanted to actually switch over to the pink genes. Because uh, with it being a more global audience, I think the pink genes are sometimes something that we understand a little bit better in bacteria. And they're a little harder for us to first get into. Because when we looked at the pink genes, um, the phenotype was much mis more subdued. So here's a wild type population right here. And on the right is that um, the population without the orange genes I told you about. So you see that nice boundary that's right here. And then these are the cells, mutant cells without the pink genes. And if you can tell, that's a pretty horrible boundary. And in, in, in fact, quite frankly, we have, whenever we have these boundaries, we have five people in the lab with, um, they literally, the plates are, 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 are randomized. And there are five people are told to score the plates. Do you see a boundary? Do you not see a boundary? How many of you would have called this a boundary? Yeah, right? I mean, it's kind of wimpy. And so we thought, wait a second, are these genes actually contributing to this phenotype? And so we had to develop a new assay to look at this. And so we turned to work in other fields where another way of thinking about um, self-segregation is actually about occupying territory. So the ability to keep space for yourself and keep your foreigners either constrained or, or, or you know, in some cases kill them. And so to do this, we actually mix our strains um, in a one-to-one -one mixture. And then we allow the population to move outwards. After they've um, uh, occupied the whole surface, we sample for either the orange or the green using different types of selective medias. And this is just a picture of the little pronging device we use. And so what you'll see are little pinpricks because it's sampling at different discrete locations on the swarm, not the whole swarm at once. Um, and we ask, what happens? And what we can see is that if your orange and your green um, overlap, that means neither migrates further, so they're happy to coexist. If um, the orange migrates further out then, and the green's constrained, that means that the orange is winning and is segregating away from the green, and vice versa, if the green goes further out, the orange gets segregated into the center. And when we look at our pink genes, so this is just the wild type control, you can see that wild type, when you mix wild type with wild type, it happily um, uh, swarms all the way out to the side. There's no competition. They all, you know, peace, love, and happiness. Um, but when the wild type mixes with the mutant, there's a little bit of constraint. And it's really subtle, but essentially the mutant doesn't quite make it as far out as the wild type. And in fact, the mutant is able to constrain how far the wild type goes itself. And so somehow, this lack of these genes is contributing to this ability, this, the sensing of neighbors as you're kind of juggling along with each other as opposed to colliding against each other. And so then we actually ask against different strains. And one thing I haven't talked about Proteus yet is that Proteus is a bully. It's not like the other bacteria who want to play nice with each other. It likes to destroy other bacteria. It makes lots of uh, you know, antibiotics and things like that. If you put Proteus on a, on, a, on a plate and E. coli next to it, it just walks right around E. coli. It doesn't even care it's there. We've put Proteus against um, other moving bacteria. It just takes over the whole plate. It is really, it's really aggressive. And so we knew that when we mixed our wild type population, 
with this other um, green produce strain that our wild type dominates. And it constrains, it doesn't kill off all of the green strain, but really constrains it to the center. So then we asked, what about what happens if you remove the pink genes? How does this contribute? And we saw a complete reversal in fortunes. If you get rid of these, these pink genes, the cells are no longer able to compete against foreign organisms. Right? So the pink genes are about your competition against other, as opposed to really understanding what's happening within your own self-population. Um, so taken together, we know that the pink genes are for competition. And so when you look at the global picture of what's happening in Proteus, we know that through the, through the combination of these orange genes and the pink genes, that they really are providing, um, sending signals into what your self-identity is, so in the, in, in, in the orange genes, and then the recognition and the detection, and I would say the destroyal of other um, through the work of your pink genes. And all of these have to get out. And we know that they all go out of the cell, and we actually know that they not just get to their neighboring cell, they actually get punctured directly into their neighboring cell through a concerted transport mechanism. So in our lab, we like to call it a handshake and dagger model, where you can imagine, you laugh, but it's, you know, I like Shakespeare, but it's a very Shakespearean thing, where we, we have lots of evidence to indicate that as these bacterial um, swarms are going against each other, each individual cell is going, they're sticking out the orange, which is the handshake, and saying, and in, you know, when I say handshake, it's basically a handshake into your innards. Imagine alien going to reverse. You guys know the alien things coming out? It's the, wow, I am really old. <laughs> <laughs> My references are dying here. But it's, it's, your hand is going out and shaking into your neighbor and twiggling to see whether or not your hand shakes there. Same time, you have a sword with a poison pill, and you're jamming it. And your siblings have the antidote to that poison, but your foreigners don't. Right? And so it's two ways of double checking. And we now have evidence in the lab that these aren't the only ways, but these are the ways that you can work towards boundaries. OK. Um, and so, in, in summary, okay. um, in summary, I really want to um, point out that we now know that the ability for self versus non-self recognition is found in bacterium. It's not just found in proteus. Many other groups have now shown it in other bacteria, such as Myxococcus xanthus. So that's this um, soil um, amoeba. They've also found it in um, Bacillus subtilis, which is a very, you know, fun, good clonal bacterium. We know that multiple gene clusters contribute to the definition of self-identity. And we know that this is a self versus non-self-recognition really contributes to this ability, Victor's ability to grow and move together. As I said, it's a social-based activity. The one caveat, we don't see this kind of segregation in liquid-grown cultures. So if they're swimming around, we don't see it. We don't see it, in, at least in our own hands, in wounds. We don't see it in biofilms. We can only so far see the segregation behavior when they're in a forced social environment of motility, where in order to move that, those centimeter distances, they need to go with the neighbor. They cannot make it by themselves. And that's where we see this interaction, this ability really come to the fore. And so I want to leave you with um, uh, some, uh, a model for self versus non-self recognition in Proteus. As I, as I said before, you have a cell, and it's able to define itself through these genetic markers. And we, it's not just about self-identity in terms of your own. And in fact, we have evidence in the lab, Chris, that it's actually not about your binding in yourself. It has nothing to do with that. Self is actually determined by the interactions with your neighboring cell. So if you're next to your neighbor, you know who you are. If you never expose who you are, it doesn't matter. Okay? So self is determined by location and by neighborhood. This self-interaction then also can occur with other organisms, those that are different. And then you're, you're, you're probing to say, oh, are, are, are you my sibling? Because this was my sibling, but, and, he, and the cells determine this. And we know that, as I mentioned before, you can have some death that results. We now know that some of the downstream signaling, um, where it changes the um, behavior of the cells when things are correct. And that allows for these cells to actually differentiate and separate allowing for cells that are similar to cluster with one another, and um, as you see here with the orange and blue, and for those that are different to choose different cell fates, let's call it that. And so in my lab, we really try and span the distance between what's happening on the subcellular level on genes and proteins to understanding how that um, leads to interactions between cells um, on the microscale as it leads to population development of individual clonal populations, and then to interactions between populations. And we go back and forth along these multiple levels of, bio, of complexity in order to really get to, this an, to the answers of what's driving self versus non-self recognition. 
Um, and so to do this, we combine multiple techniques. We use uh, general traditional microbiological techniques. We use a lot of biochemistry and genetics, uh, microscopy. We're now starting to do a lot of bioinformatics and cell biology as well. Um, some of the many questions, very global questions, that I'd like you to go away with. And this is true whether or not you're studying bacteria or you're studying eukaryotes, so that means animals and things like that. When how did self-recognition behavior occur in any organism? Why in the world does proteas want to do this? So I've you know, shown you a lot that it does it, but I even answered the question of why. What benefit is there to having one protease strain per person? What benefit is there to have one protease strain per oyster cell or per, per steak? What is, if anything, is driving the persistence of self versus non-self recognition within a species? And is this something that's required in, in nature? Is this something that if we look at every single social organism or every organism that has a capability of sociality, will we find that they also have the ability for self versus non-self recognition? And I would argue that in fact, in order to be social, there has to be an ability to understand the difference between genetically identical and genetically non-identical. And in fact, when we look at the broad number of systems in which we see sociality, I already talked to you about um, the vertebrate immune system and wolf packs, we see it in ants, we see it in sea tunicates, we see it in social amoeba, we see it in bacteria, and every single one of these organisms where they are social, we see the ability for self versus non-self recognition. And over and over, it's the same story. Cell surface markers, things that are displayed on one cell, see, another, see, see a binding partner on another cell, they bind, the variable regions are what matters, and that leads to some kind of social behavior. And so um, this is my argument, that we can really use bacteria as a simplified model to explore the influence of genetics and environments on group behaviors, because we can really change the environment they're in. We can do evolutionary cell studies where we look at millennia of generations in hopefully my lifespan, um, as opposed to a wolf pack, which that'd be much harder. And we can start teasing apart what the contribution of any one of these um, self-recognition genes, self-identity genes are on the actual population behavior. And so with that, I'm going to conclude by thanking many years of people in my lab, and we'll just kind of flick through the pictures, but um, Nora is the one who, uh, uh, she uh, is the one who led the transpose immunogenesis screen, which is a follow-on to the work I did as a postdoc, as well as many people in the lab over the years. We like to have fun. If you haven't been up to Cambridge, you should come visit us. Um, we like to go boating, clearly. And uh, I just want to finally um, thank our funding. Who have made, and those who have made it fun over the years. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. So if you can come up to the mic, that would be great. Or yell. Or yell. I can yell. Um, so the consequence of self to self um, seems to be different in terms of motility. Yeah. Because you said when you have small clusters, they don't move very quickly, but large clusters are moving rapidly. Yeah. Um, but it also seems like the cells on the boundaries of the large clusters didn't move very quickly, but everybody inside moved quickly. Do you have any idea about? Yeah, so, so you're getting to some really um, fun kind of, uh, uh, of the front line of what we're doing in my group. And so the short answer is, the movie is just one of many, and so I wouldn't say anything about cells on the outside moving less or more fast than cells on the inside. I think that we don't have the data for that. But what I would say is that we're signing a lot of, you know, not necessarily that surprising, but really fun information suggesting that that self-self interaction, the population behavior that it's controlling, is more than likely due to how well they move with each other. While self-non-self, rather than causing killing, it seems to be disrupting that ability to work well together in movement. Um, and so, you know, in, in, we can talk more deeply about what those you know, genetic pathways are, but this is idea that it's about keeping cells that know each other as being genetically identical, keeping them clustered to each other so that you have productive interactions, productive motility, and those that are different, we don't have that nice binding interaction, it's kind of like oil and water, they kind of can't get their act together, right? So, if I understood this correctly, D and E, biochemically, you've shown that they interact. Yeah. But they're on the membrane underneath all this peptidoglycan. Oh, you're a cell. biologist. <laughs> and, and so, I'm just trying to picture in these swarming cells, yeah. is that cell wall, have the, have the sort of the skies parted, 
to allow the membranes to interact? And, and if so, is that part of the mechanics of motion where you have multiple copies of these two proteins yeah. across membranes helping move? You're, you're a biologist. And so I skipped over all the complexity of biology for a second. So if I, again, oh, okay, well, close oh. enough. I apologize, I'm going to geek out for 30 seconds. Um, can I draw over here if that's okay? Okay, so I work on the gram-negative bacteria. And so if you think of this as your genes, the DNA is down here, you have one membrane, and then you have a cell, so wait, what it means by cell wall is just it's, you know, just a rigid layer of, um, sh of sh essentially sugars, peptidoglycans, and then you have another double membrane. And then on the outside of this double membrane, you have huge amounts of sugars, right? It's like, you know, all sorts of craziness. And so when you have two cells coming together, um, they have to get across the sugars, right? And then beyond that, I didn't say this, but E is sitting here. And now from new work in my lab, we know that D is sitting over here. And so as best as we can tell, what happens is the two cells get really close to each other, and somehow they're able to kind of share this area. So you have a, a, a parent, another cell kind of here. And D actually gets transported all the way across using that transport mechanism. We don't know the physics of it, but it gets there. And we know it has to get there through this transport. And we know that if it doesn't go through that transport, it doesn't work. So it gets there, and it shoves itself in. And then that's where the interaction happens. And so that's why I think it's, you know, it's this thing where we actually see it takes a little time for it to happen. So I think there's, take, there's an actual physical time it takes for these proteins to move and fold properly and to get to the right place. The readout also, we don't know how fast the readout once you get an interaction is. And we're starting to, we now have some markers for what's being turned on by them. And so I think then the next couple of years where we really can start doing much better um, uh, analysis both on the RNA level, so RNA-seq type of things, as well as actual reporter, fluorescent reporters, then we can start talking about how good of an interaction do you have to have? How fast of a transfer do you have to have? How closely do these two membranes need to come into contact with each other? So it's, I mean, it's, it's like sending a scout across the membrane. I mean, it's very Shakespearean. Exactly. I like, the, I like the alien kind of going in. But, you know, it's the same, it's the same concept, right? It's, it's, it's really, it really is probing. So, yeah. So, and I'll leave, I'll leave it at that. There was a question here. Then. Hi. That, is this on? That was really interesting. Um, so I'm wondering if you can use this the mutation rate in these genes to estimate how, how um, guarded the sense of self is. So if it's, so obviously these, all of these strains evolve from a single proteus, and a single proteus then is going to evolve into different strains of proteus. So are, do these genes accumulate mutations at a faster rate than the rest of the genome, or are they protected? Yeah, so you're asking a question about speciation. Um, and th there are two slightly complicated answers. And so I'll give you the, the easy trite answer, which is that we see that for the orange genes, they're coming into the species. And so they are associated with mobile elements, with phage elements. And so when you look at proteus strains, only about 75% of proteus strains have the orange proteins. The ones that don't have it, they're perfectly happy. They don't care. But so then why are the ones who are getting it keeping it? Right? And, why is, and so there's something there. Um, I'm not enough of an evolutionary biologist to tell you what that is. In terms of mutation rates, we actually don't see a higher mutation rate in this, in this area. And in fact, we see what we think is a little bit weirdly low. So those variable regions are quite different. But when we, you know, we've allowed, we've done some evolution experiments. We allow them to, you know, grow either on plates or we passage them for time. And we don't see things accumulate in those regions. We can see accumulations elsewhere in the genome, but not in these regions. And in fact, even down to the um, uh, base pair level, the nucleotide level, these genes, for the way they're conserved, they're almost, a, you know, they're over 96% conserved even on the nucleotide level, which is just crazy. That's crazy conservation. So there's clearly some kind of mechanism that's working. For the pink genes, it's more complicated. The pink genes are clearly part of a mobile area. There's things happening there. And we're just not quite ready to talk about that. Coming from the standpoint of a pharmacologist, that you follow the way to target this process for the development of really specific antibiotics. That's what we're patenting. <laughs> so, so yes, we're, we're in the midst of uh, applying for patents for it. And I'm happy to talk to you about it after. So you mentioned that, that um, Curtis is a bit of a bully. And so does that mean that it has more, the, 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 and that requires pink proteins? Is that because they're, they have um, 
antidotes to pink proteins of other strains or because their pink proteins are more effective? Yeah, that's a harder thing. So from what we can tell, so we only know this for three protein strains. In the three strains, the pink proteins are different, right? And so we've yet to find, let me, let me make sure I say this properly. Some protease strains have antidotes to other protease strains. Some strains don't. And, you know, if you base it based on that, you can find a king of the hill in terms of that behavior. But then if you move them into a different environment, you no longer find, so if you don't coast form them, you do something else, you no longer have a king of a hill. So in this specific assay, yes, I think that that is very much the case. They move better when they're in groups. What is the mechanism they're flagella. So I didn't mention this, but um, these 80 micron cells, they are chock full of flagella. So their flagella are everywhere. It's peritrichus, and it's estimated something like 60 to 80 copies of the flagellum are on these cells. So this is, you know, this is like Medusa gone wild. And it's all over, and we, so they're so fun. You can actually see, so the flagella, by the way, are these huge appendages that sometimes people refer to as bacterial tails, but they, they're huge, and they whip around. And, you know, you can, we can actually see them bundle in the, in, in the phase microscope, my, under phase microscopy, and you can see the bundles go. So you can actually see the flagella. I mean, these are, again, sub-visual structures. You can actually, they bundle so tightly and so large, you can see them visually. Um, using light microscopy, which is just, I love that for freshmen. I just take them in and I'm like, oh, look. And so that's how they move. So they basically, if you think of it as a Greek ship with many oars, their oars come together and essentially the, through the force of movement, it's enough to get over the surface tension and that propels them forward. There's a question here. That almost... So in this boundary regions where you have two different kinds of bacteria, do the bacteria that are in that <coughs> sort of war zone behave any differently those were clustered with their kin. Yeah. We haven't found anything yet. To be, to be really honest, we've been looking. We haven't found anything yet, but maybe our techniques aren't sensitive enough. Um, I, I've never someone to say, I don't like to say never, so we haven't seen anything yet. Thank you. That was great. Cool. Thank you. Um, so throughout your talk, I was thinking about mouse, uh, because yeah. they, they cooperate in a very similar way to these bacteria. They yeah. have the gel um, and they can recognize um, within their species. Yeah. If you make an interspecific mixture, they will clump with their own species. Yeah. So I wonder whether anyone had taken a similar approach to try and isolate what parts of the sperm heads are being recognized by kin. Yeah, so there's terrific work from a colleague of mine, Hopi Hoekstra. Yeah. So it's H O E K S T R A. Um, she's in OEB and MCB, and that's exactly. Oh, yes. And hi, exactly. And this is exactly, that's exactly what they're doing, is that they're asking, so to, to restate for everyone, what we know from, um, and my, so for sperm, and so my sperm is an uh, example, but I think this is probably going to be true for many sperm, is that in order to, for sperm to move, it's not just that it by itself, it actually binds and clusters with neighboring sperm. And that cluster is able to move faster and more efficiently than any single sperm. Are you going to correct me? <laughs> Oh, okay. And so anyway, so long story short is the clustering is, is identity based and Hopi has done a lot of work to show in, in that eukaryotic system what are some of the markers. And again, they'll sell, 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 sell surface markers that allow for proteins to know who each other is. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's it, exactly, it's a nice, con you know, I, I like when you see the same example happening over and over again. So the question is, you know, for me, the bigger question is, is it divergent evolution? Did they all, was there one progenitor cell who, in order to become multicellular, said, I have to know what myself is? Or is it convergent, where over and over, over history, as you had to do things together, different organisms have come up with essentially the same route to come up with the answer. And that, ugh, I mean, I think that's the $10 million question. What I was going to ask is, uh, in clumping, does the physics apply so if the movement itself becomes easy, so it's energetically favorable? Is that the, the idea over here? So if the amount of AGT you're going to use for the gala and the amount of power that you generate in clumping? Uh, so, so, yes, yeah, so, so I'm waving my hand because this is big black box in the Proteus field. So there's been a lot of work on the, um, on the concentric circles, so the periodicity that you see. And there's been a lot of work on kind of flagella motion, but connecting the molecular 
um, aspects, so the physical aspects of you know, ATP, so how much energy you have per cell, how persistent your cell is, how fast your flagella rotate, how much load they can take, none of that's done in Proteus. I mean, it's, it's shocking, but almost none of that's been studied. So we don't have, I don't have the answer. We don't know. Uh, so thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, on a basic philosophical level, what, does, what distinguishes this from a chemical compound crystallizing only with your pin for complicated molecules, slightly tweaking the molecule might or might not cause this segregation, et cetera. So what's, what's different? I don't think anything's different. I think that that's the, I mean, isn't that shocking that that could be the ba a basis of a, of a multicellular behavior? Clearly there's something different, right? So what's happening is that it's not just the molecules tweaking, is that it's causing um, a change in the transcription, change in the behavior of the cell, changing other genes that are made, other proteins that are made. So it's more like a light switch turning on and off, and then other things, you know, once the light's on, you can do a bunch of other things. But fundamentally, isn't that intriguing that it could come down to just molecular recognition? It could come down to, it's back to this idea. I don't know how many of you know about the idea of our RNA world or the initial. I mean, it comes back to the fundamentals of what makes, what, what makes life life. And so I don't think it's, I don't think conceptually it's that different. So I was just going to ask, um, does conditioned media from suspension culture affect swarming ability? No. So, and, and I didn't say the words quorum sensing, I should have said that. There's no quorum sensing in Proteus as far as we can tell. This is the closest we've gotten to kind of group collective behavior. Um, there's no, we don't see any traditional molecules for that. We've tried a whole bunch of things like spent culture, all the traditional things, none of that matters um, as far as we can tell. So macroscopically, topically, we can see by our eyes that I mean, one type of bacteria is it distinguish themselves with the other type of bacteria. And microscopically, we know that this is induced by the interaction between proteins and genes, or what's in between. I mean, microscopically, it's a local interaction. But from our point of view, we see, oh, it, it's a global. Yeah. Do you want to come do a postdoc with me? I mean, I'm actually, I mean, that, that is the big question we're at. Oh, I probably shouldn't say this since it's taped. <laughs> you hit, that's a great question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a terrific question. <laughs> yeah, so, um, is there a difference on the level of transcription of this pink, orange, and, and green proteins when they are sort of in the media hanging out by themselves versus Ah, uh, you go. Um, the short answer is yes, and, and you're getting to the hard question. So the pink genes are always on. So the, the sword with the poison pill, they always make that sword, and they're just kind of dragging it along. Right, whether liquid, surface, it doesn't matter. We, every time we look, we can just find them. Not, 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 not high, they're just minimal, but just kind of, you know, just in case. The, the orange ones actually are only on um, bimodally. So that means half the population has it on, half the population has it off. When they're in liquid, we don't see the self-recognition. The ones who have it on barely have it on. Once they get on the surface, they turn it on. The ones who have it on really turn it on. And the ones who have it off still keep it off. And we found that that's actually stochastic. So in other words, each generation, it's not inherited who will be the one who has it. Each generation, you're randomly chosen to whether or not your orange genes are on, your orange genes are off. So we like to think of it as being some kind of, there must be some kind of um, minimal detection that's necessary. But there's clearly a cost to having them on. So the whole population isn't, isn't doing the surveillance. So imagine if you had sentries, right? The easiest way to think about this handshake is imagine that if every door, you had one person who had to check your ID. So not everyone in the audience has to have an ID, but enough of you have to have it in order to come in, right? And so that's the same idea is that they don't, ha they don't all have to have the ID, but enough of them has to be there so that when you detect something that's different, they can say, wait a second, ah, you're not one of us. Um, but well, well, yeah, but that's, it's fun. It's actually fun. Uh, does similarity of these short sequences predict similarity of the genome? Oh, yes. We don't have enough sequences to know for sure. We've been, we've been, we've been collecting. By the way, if anyone has Proteus strains, please contact me. We're always collecting Proteus. I'm actually very serious. We're always happily collecting Proteus strains because we, wanted to, we are actually trying to do that exact thing. Um, so we just don't have enough genome sequences completely close to know. And clearly, you know, so one of the dirty tricks about uh, genome sequencing is that there are a lot of these dark areas. Turns out a lot of things we're interested in tend to occur with these dark areas. So the answer to that question, we need to close those dark areas and that we have to do by hand. 
which takes a lot of time and money still. Um, and so we just don't know the answer to that. Uh, are these genes tied to the chromosome or are they on plasmids and are therefore, in a lot of bacterial strains, genes don't really tie to the individual. They move freely yeah. between uh, different hosts. So it sort of challenged the whole idea of identity if, if the gene isn't always tied to the germline in a sense. So in these orange and pink genes, are they moving around between strains or are they just absolutely locked in the genome? They're locked in the genome. So we, what, what we see found is once they're in, they don't go anywhere. Um, and that's one of the dirty secrets about parties is that it's actually not the best genetic organism. And genes, they're, they're locked in. They're chromosomal, single copy. But can they move, you said, on viral vectors? So they have, they have elements that seem that they've come from viruses, but we don't actually see them hop between strains. And for example, with the orange genes, we've never found two strains with the exact same sequence across the orange. Like they're mostly there, and you get to those variable regions, and suddenly something's wrong, and then Right? And so, but again, we have like 25 strains. We need, we need like vibrio cholera number of strains in order to really make that statement. And we just don't have, we have not sequenced that many yet. So you mentioned that there was a single copy of the E gene per cell and like five or six or seven D genes, is that right? So the uh, opposite, but yes, that's the matter. One copy so one of one and multiple copies of the other. The one that's going across between cells is the multi-copy one? That's the single copy one. Oh, it's a single so I guess what I was wondering is with the multi-copy one, is there some sort of combinatorial interaction between the variation uh, of those multiple copies within one or yeah. that, And then you can play with changing identity by switching, like taking one copy and putting it in the other. Yeah. So I would love that that was the case. But we've, we've taken our own strain and taken the other, e, the other copies and tried to bind the D to them. And D doesn't bind. It only binds its one partner and nobody else. Um, and then we've tried to find other partner Ds to those Es, and we can't find one that binds. So there's something. There's one pair in every. There's one pair that, at least in the couple of strains we've looked at, there's one pair, and it's the two, the two genes that live next to each other. So it's the D and E, they live right next to each other. Those guys bind, that's identity, and as far as we can tell, in Proteus. Um, you don't know what the other ones are doing. We don't know what the other ones are doing. They're moonlighting, they're doing something, <laughs> but if we don't know what. What are the different mechanisms of killing? So is this a prolific antibiotic producer, like Streptomyces, or is there a different way? Because if it's such a bully, it's got to be able to fight a lot of different things. Yeah. So the, the short answer is that we know some of the things and some not. So, so and it's actually neither of the genes I've shown you, none of the genes I've shown you are necessarily the best killers, right? Um, but there are other toxins on the Proteus genome that it can secrete. One of the things also is that because it moves so fast, it's able to just actually occupy territory. And so, you know, I, I don't know if I'd call that killing, but it's all that out competition of resources. Um, we do know that there's some ways for it to actually cause cells to lyse through some other enzymes. Um, so there are a couple of different, I mean, a lot of them are traditional bacterial toxin antitoxin systems. How do you observe all this? What do you mean? I mean what can you see and how do you see it? So how about I do some, say something different? What do we do in my lab? Yeah. How do we do all this? Well, I luckily have a lot of really talented graduate students in my lab um, and postdocs. But you know, in the last 20 years in microbiology, there's been a, you know there's a huge number of tools where you can put colors on genes, either on the control for the genes on and off, or you can actually put them on the gene itself. So in other words, the protein that's made can actually have a little, you know, good little flashlight on it that blinks. And every time it goes somewhere, you're like, oh, look, there's that little light going. So we can do genetic engineering in that way. We well, can. She's not joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we do it by light. I didn't, I mean, that's what the green and the and red I showed early on. We also can change the genome. We can, we spent my lab, um, has spent a lot of time in the last six years really developing the genetic tools in Proteus. So we can, we can put new sequences in the genome. We can swap out parts of the genome. I mean, this is something that people have done in E. coli for years. Proteus, not so easily, but in E. coli, this is not uncommon. So, you know, this is a lot of the gene engineering. So if you think about, um, let's see, Craig Ventner. Remember, I don't know if you guys remember when Craig Ventner um, did the first synthetic bacterium and they were able to put in their names in the genome. Right? We're not quite that cool, we don't put our names in, but we've now figured out how for Proteus to put little names, little signatures in. 
um, when we look at different sequence, when we look at different strains in the environment, we can take their DNA and sequence it. We can take those um, cells, break them open, and ask what are RNA. So what little what things genes are being turned on or off in those? Well, my lab also does a lot of microscopy. We do a lot of imaging. So we do we use light, traditional light microscopy and then epifluorescent microscopy to ask what's happening on a single cell or subcell level. But we also do a lot of imaging with cameras. We have a cam, you know we have a just normal kind of Canon camera setup. Um, where we take images of plates and we ask, so instead of just looking at that micro scale, what's happening with the whole population? And we can take those pictures while also combining them with the other tools I told you about and look at, well, if I tag this cell, where is it going or what is it doing over time? Okay, both on the micro scale and on the macro scale. Some of the other things, the biochemistry, you take the proteins, you, you know, there's lots, I, I am not an expert biochemist. And so we do the best we can to do, um, to work with these proteins and ask who are they binding. Um, other things that we do, what's another fun experiment? Oh, and then we often, the first thing every undergrad in our lab does is traditional microbiology. We say, pick up your plate and smell it. This is how you can tell if you have contamination or not. If it stinks, it's Proteus. If it's sweet smelling, it's E. coli. Toss your plate. And you, you laugh, but it's true, right? And, and we work on them for streaking out single colonies. And when you're working on something like self versus non-self, you have to always worry about mutation rates. And so we teach them about how you look for mutants, things that no longer can grow into the right conditions. Are you making sure that you're actually getting what you're looking for? Um, we do, so just, I mean, all sorts of those things. I mean, it's, it's fun. It's, it's kind of all over the place. I have a question about a um, little more biochemistry. Okay. So have you guys tried to use any kind of inhibitors to disrupt the DNA interactions? No. Or to get the inhibitor interactions to let the DNA into a cognitive? So we've not, we've not done those yet. So those are, those are assays that are in progress. Um, the, the one problem with inhibitors is that if you put liquid on a previous swarm, the cells will actually come off and start swimming. And so we've had, we're, we're still trying to figure out, you know, so ideally we'd like to use a polymer of some type, and so we're still trying to figure out the right way to deliver that type of assay, um, but we just, we haven't talked about it. What happens if you use genetic engineering to saturate uh, the, the density of both of the signals in a single bacteria, and then you inoculate the bacteria? Oh, we haven't done that. That's a great experiment. No, we haven't done that. That's a really good experiment. Yeah, I don't know what the answer will be. <laughs> Christina might have work to do when I get back. So we turn okay. to a pumpkin at 7, so get your questions in now. OK, if you don't have any more, then we can all go home early. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.